to present a portion of your holy and divine word. Pray that you will be with my special guest speaker, Tim Bench, on the broadcast this evening. We pray that you will continue to bless his efforts to sow the seed of the kingdom. And we pray that the things that he say may be edifying to our spirits and beneficial to our spiritual lives as we serve you with a pure heart. Father, we pray that you would be with all my guests who are on the broadcast and pray that you would be with my co-host as well as he presents a portion of your word as well. Father, we pray for our listeners that they may listen well and that they may hear something that will cause them to consider their eternal stance before you and their soul salvation. Father, we pray that you will continue to bless our efforts on this broadcast that much good will come from it. Father, we thank you so much for Jesus and all that he means to us in this life and in the life to come. For we recognize that without his precious sacrifice on Calvary, we would not even have a hope of eternal life. Father, continue to bless us and love us and keep us all the days of our lives. And if we have been faithful unto death, Father, we pray that you would save us. For us in Christ's name, we do ask it all. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to welcome you to What a Word from the Lord. I'm your host, Stevie R. Butler. We have a great show lined up for you on this evening. My special guest speaker, he's one of my co-hosts on the Gospel Light Radio Show, Tim Bench. He always does a fine job in the proclamation of the Gospel of Jesus Christ. So We always look forward to having Tim on the broadcast. And then in the second segment of the show, the Community Corner, my special guest in that segment will be Jeremy Roberts. Jeremy's been on the broadcast before presenting a lesson from the scriptures, but this time he's going to talk to us about marketing for the church. So we look forward to hearing Jer- Jeremy's presentation on the broadcast as well. And then in the third segment of the broadcast, my co-host, Edward Bishop. He's also uh, a co-host on the Gospel Light radio show that brother just loves to preach the gospel so we always look forward to hearing a word from edward as well and then i'll close out the show with a lesson as well i'll be discussing marriage and divorce on the show this evening so thank you all for tuning in to what a word from the lord the next voice you hear after this song will be that of my special guest speaker tim bench thank you for tuning into the broadcast Road, Jordan Road, Road, Jordan Road, I want to go to heaven when I die. To bend there. Oh, mother, you ought to bend there. Lord, mother, you ought to bend there. Father, you ought to bend there. Oh, Father, you ought to bend there. Oh, Father, you ought to bend there. To bend there. Oh, sister, you ought to bend there. Well, sister, you ought to bend there. To roll your road. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord, oh, Lord, oh, Lord, oh, Lord.
want to go to heaven when I die. Oh, brother, you ought to be there. To been there. I want to go to heaven when I die. I be Christian, you ought to be there. My name is Tim Bench, and it is a pleasure to be with you tonight, wherever you are listening in tonight. We want to welcome you to this special edition, and uh, I am calling in from Abilene, Texas. And we hope that everyone, as always, finds these studies uh, beneficial and edifying. Our topic tonight is a difficult one, and what we're going to be looking at is perhaps the most violent terrifying, blood-drenched event in all of human history, at least one of the most violent events in human history, that being the siege of Jerusalem in 70 A.D. by the military forces of the most powerful government the world has ever known, the Roman Empire. This attack stands in history as perhaps the most shockingly brutal example conceivable of man's brutality to man even surpassing the Holocaust of World War II in the eyes of many historians, if such atrocities can even be compared. And it's for this reason that before we get started, I want to suggest, uh, in collaboration with Stevie and the other Gospel Light members, that young children might not want to be exposed to tonight's teaching. We might want to issue a parental warning or a PG rating Uh, as some of the details that we're going to discuss here might be too much for children or even some adults to hear. As we get started, one might logically ask the question, well, what is the purpose of a study of the siege of Jerusalem in 70 A.D.? After all, this event was not specifically discussed in the Bible, after all. The answer to why this is necessary as a study is twofold. Number one, Jesus himself very clearly issues prophecy regarding this event in Matthew chapter 24, verses 4 through 26. As per Howard Denham, quote, Matthew 24, 4 through 26 especially deals with the destruction of Jerusalem, 27 to 33 as transition, 35 onward to the final coming, end quote. It's important to note here that there is a huge difference in prophecy of an event versus Jesus returning during that said event, which we will look at in some detail tonight. 
I also want to recommend an excellent article online by David Padfield entitled The Destruction of Jerusalem. If Jesus saw fit to make declarations of this disastrous bellwether event in the course of human history, it very much becomes an event we desperately need to study and consider today. Second reason. Many churches of Christ now teach and promote that the siege in 70 A.D. fulfilled all New Testament prophecy and that Jesus returned during this horrific slaughter and that there is now no second coming. If such teachings don't justify a study of this event, nothing will. And thousands of Christians are being led along into the belief that Jesus' return and judgment was somehow missed by the tens of thousands of marauding Roman soldiers, the vast Roman Empire, Titus, Vespasian, the thousands of Jews who would perish in terror and agony within the walls of the holy city, and all Jewish historians, scholars, and scribes of the day. Tonight's lesson will be the first of two on the topic of Jerusalem. The focus for this evening will be on the siege itself. What led up to it? What were the environmental factors that were going on? What was the rationale for the Roman army to attack this city? We're going to look at the factors which led to the stomach-churning documentation of what actually transpired during this siege and the immediate aftermath. Doug Post uh, will present part two of this study on May the 7th, and on that evening, Doug will specifically address uh, more of the details of the event, and will likewise offer proof that realized eschatology, or full preterism, which is the view that Jesus returned during this battle, that will be the basis and the topic of his focus, and he will look at how that is in categorical conflict with what the Bible tells us about his second coming. And again, it's amazing to consider uh, all of us pretty much have been taught all of our lives that there will be a future coming of Jesus. It's important, again, to note or to distinguish this movement emphasizes Jesus has already come again in 70 A.D. Let's start with some definitions. What is realized eschatology? What does that term mean? Well, from James Orr with the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia, quote, eschatology the doctrine of last things is meant, the ideas entertained at any period on the future life, the end of the world, resurrection judgment, and the eternal destinies of mankind, end quote. End quote. And realized signifies accomplishment. So if we have realized eschatology, by definition, we have something that has already concluded and has already been fulfilled. What importance does this have? What relevance does this have? Well, in very short uh, summary, realized eschatology teaches that all Bible prophecy has been fulfilled. The second coming of Christ has already occurred. The resurrection of the dead has already occurred. The day of judgment has already occurred. Again, with their belief being that all these things were fulfilled in 70 A.D. at the destruction of and the attack upon Jerusalem. The term preterism is one that we will mention tonight. What does preterism mean? Preterism, meaning that which is past, teaches that the bulk of prophecy, including the entire book of Revelation, was fulfilled in the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 A.D. And again, an important distinction to keep in mind as we progress through this study there is a vast difference between uh, biblical prophecy being fulfilled and Jesus appearing at Jerusalem in 70 A.D. We have moderate preterism. I'm going to quote here from Thomas Ice with the introduction to the Great Tribulation, past or future. Quote, moderate preterism sees the tribulation and the bulk of Bible prophecy as fulfilled in events surrounding the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple in A.D. 70, but they still hold to a future second coming, a physical resurrection of the dead, an end to temporal history, and the establishing of the consummate new heaven and new earth, end quote. Now, let's compare that with full preterism. Again, quoting from Thomas Ice, quote, extreme or consistent, as they like to call themselves, preterism believes that the second coming and thus 
the resurrection of believers is all past. For all practical purposes, all Bible prophecy has been fulfilled, end quote. From Theopedia, preterism defined a view in Christian eschatology which holds that some or all of the biblical prophecies concerning the last days refer to events which took place in the first century after Christ's birth, especially associated with the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 A.D. The term preterism comes from the Latin praetor, meaning past, since this view deems certain biblical prophecies as past or already fulfilled, end quote. So that provides us a bit of information on the definitions and the parameters of some of the terminology that we will be looking at tonight. Here are some examples of teaching that goes on nowadays that Jesus returned in 70 A.D. This is a quote from Don Preston in Hebrews 9.28, the second coming, quote, Since Christ's coming in 70 was the coming for redemption, and since he was to return only once for salvation per Hebrews 9.28, then Christ's return in 70 was the final coming of Christ, end quote. More from Don Preston in a critical text, quote, We conclude that Matthew 16, 27 to 28 is a prediction by Jesus to return in judgment in his kingdom glory in the lifetime of his disciples, end quote. If Jesus died in approximately 33 A.D., you would have about a 37-year gap between his death and the attack at Jerusalem, and again, this time frame uh, becomes the foundation for many people's belief in preterism. From the Eschatology Conference, this is from the biography on Holger Neubauer, quote, for the, first, for the past 10 years of continued study, he developed solid convictions from the irrefutable evidence that Christ had returned and that all Bible prophecy was fulfilled in 70 A.D., end quote. This teaching is not new within churches of Christ. If we go back into the early 1970s, 1971 to be specific, there was a very well-known Church of Christ preacher named Max King who began to promote this doctrine. He had several writings that we are going to look at very quickly this evening. This is from a 1971 uh, writing of Max King, quote, there is no scriptural basis for extending the second coming of Christ beyond the fall of Judaism, end quote. Another quote from Max King, quote, the end of the Jewish world was the second coming of Christ, end quote. Third quote from Mr. King, prophecy found its complete fulfillment in the second coming of Christ and now may be regarded as closed and consummated. End quote. Again, from Max King, quote, It is the second coming, and it is his coming in the fall of Jerusalem, for these are not two separate comings, but one. End quote. From Max King again, The fall of Judaism and its far-reaching consequences is therefore a major subject of the Bible. The greater portion of prophecy found its fulfillment in that event, including also the types and shadows of the law. It was the coming of Christ in glory that closely followed his coming in suffering, 1 Peter 1.11, when all things written by the prophets were fulfilled, Luke 21.22 and Acts 3.21. From Max King in his debate with Gus Nichols in July 1973, uh, Mr. King states, quote, that the church was in the grave or the casket of Judaism until the Roman army destroyed Jerusalem, end quote. And finally, from the Nichols-King debate, again, this is from Max King, quote, the Holy Scriptures teach the second coming of Christ, including the establishment of the eternal kingdom, the day of judgment, and the end of the world, and the resurrection of the dead occurred with the fall of Judaism in 70 A.D., end quote. And there are many other citations from Max King that we could look at, but I think that we very quickly get the idea and the gist of his teachings. From Jess Whitlock, 
from the January 2015 issue of Defender, quote, According to Max King, the destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70 by the Roman armies of Titus culminated with the second final coming of Christ. So there will be no future return of Christ. The resurrection of the dead occurred, and thus there will be no bodily resurrection yet to come. The final judgment day took place in A.D. 70, and there is no future judgment, end quote. I think all of us very quickly can see how dramatically important and imperative this study is. Is the 70 AD doctrine true? If it is, it will exert massive influence on our Christian walk. We've talked about Max King back in 1971, and many people make the assumption that that is where these teachings began. The origins of this belief, however, far predate Max King. From Michael Hatcher with the Bellevue Church of Christ in Pensacola, quote, The origins of the preterist view of prophetic interpretation was from the Spanish Jesuit Luis de Alcazar, 1554-1613, and the part that he played in the Counter-Reformation. The papal Roman Catholic Church commissioned de Alcazar and another Jesuit priest to develop false interpretations of prophecy to take the heat off the Pope who was feeling some discomfort from the Protestant reformers' talk that the papacy was the Antichrist. The whole idea of the preterism view was that if the Antichrist had been fulfilled in the past, then it could not be the papacy. Preterism claims that the apocalyptic prophecies, especially those dealing with the Antichrist, were fulfilled before the papacy ever ruled Rome. Since they were already fulfilled... The prophecies could not apply to the papacy. The preterist view ignores the fact that within the Old Testament are the foundation of prophetic interpretation, and this foundation produces a broader view revealing the fatal flaws of the false preterist interpretation. End quote. Just how bad, just how violent, just how barbaric was this siege? I want us to consider this briefly because, again, this becomes a very important consideration as we progress with this study. From E.H. Plumptree with the Ellicott's commentary on the whole Bible, quote, Other sieges may have witnessed before and since scenes of physical wretchedness equally appalling, but nothing that history records offers anything parallel to the alternations of fanatic hope and frenzied despair that attended the breaking up of the faith and polity of Israel, end quote. From R.C. Linsky in the interpretation of Matthew, quote, No nation had ever piled up a guilt such as that of the Jews who were chosen of God, infinitely blessed, and yet crucified God's Son and trampled upon all his further grace. No judgment had ever and can ever be so severe in the history of the world. No judgment can be compared with this that wiped out the Jews as a nation, end quote. From Alfred Edersheim in the Life and Times of Jesus the Messiah, quote, The tribulation to Israel was unparalleled in the terrible past of its history and unequaled even in its bloody future. Nay, so dreadful would be the persecution that if divine mercy had not interposed for the sake of the followers of Christ, the whole Jewish race that inhabited the land would have been swept away, end quote. Finally, from UK apologetics in Jerusalem, A.D. 70, the worst desolation ever, question mark, quote, It has been said that there is scarcely another period in history so full of vice, corruption, and disaster as the six years between the Neronian Christian persecution from 64 A.D., and the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 A.D. The prophetic description of the last days by our Lord began to be fulfilled before the generation to which he spoke had passed away, exactly as he had stated in Matthew 24, 34. The day of judgment upon the Jewish people seemed to be close at hand. This is what the Christians believed and indeed subsequently had good reason to believe. Josephus, a personal witness to the events, claims that over 1.1 million people were killed during the initial siege, of which a majority were Jewish. 97,000 
were captured and enslaved. Many fled to areas around the Mediterranean. Titus reportedly refused to accept a wreath of victory as there is, quote, no merit in vanquishing people forsaken by their own God. During the siege, there was mass starvation in which cannibalism widely occurred with, it is believed, some mothers even devouring their own children. Later, there were even mass crucifixions to the degree that wood eventually became unavailable, end quote. Again, some of the horrors, some of the uh, afflictions that were laid down during this siege are absolutely astounding and gut-wrenching. We mentioned the name Flavius Josephus. Josephus was a Jewish historian at the time, probably most well-known for writing the famous uh, Antiquities of the Jews. Let's look very carefully at an observation from Josephus, again, a direct witness to this event. Listen carefully to the horrors that descended upon the city of Jerusalem. Quote, Throughout the city, people were dying of hunger in large numbers and enduring unspeakable sufferings. In every house, the merest hint of food sparked violence, and close relatives fell to blows, snatching from one another the pitiful supports of life. No respect was paid even to the dying. The ruffians searched them in case they were concealing food somewhere in their clothes or just pretending to be near death. Gaping with hunger like mad dogs, lawless gangs went staggering and reeling down the streets, battering upon the doors like drunkards and so bewildered that they broke into the same house two or three times in an hour. Need drove the starving to gnaw at anything. Refuse, which even animals would reject, was collected and turned into food. In the end, they were eating belts and shoes, and the leather stripped off their shields. Tufts of withered grass were devoured and sold in little bundles for four drachmas. But why dwell on the commonplace rubbish which the starving were driven to feed upon, given that what I have to recount is an, uh, an act unparalleled in the history of either the Greeks or the barbarians, and is horrible to relate as it is incredible to hear. Among the residents of the region beyond Jordan was a woman called Mary, daughter of Eleazar on the village of Bethesuba, the name meaning house of Hyssop. She was well off and of good family and had fled to Jerusalem with her relatives where she became involved with the siege. Most of the property she had packed up and brought with her from Perea had been plundered by the tyrants, Simon and John, and the rest of her treasure, together with such foods as she had been able to procure, was being carried off by their henchmen in the daily raids. In her bitter resentment, the poor woman cursed and abused these extortioners, and this incensed them against her. However, no one put her to death, either from exasperation or pity. She grew weary of trying to find food for her kinsfolk. In any case, it was by now impossible to get any wherever you tried. Famine gnawed at her vitals, and the fire of rage was even fiercer than famine. So, driven by fury and want, she committed a crime against nature. Seizing her child, an infant at the breast, she cried, My poor baby, why should I keep you alive in this world of war? In famine, even if we live until the Romans come, they will make slaves of us. In any way, hunger will get us before slavery does, and the rebels are crueler than both. Come, be food for me, and an avenging fury to the rebels, and a tale of cold horror to the world to complete the monstrous agony of the Jews. With these words, she killed her son, roasted the body, swallowed half of it, and stored the rest in a safe place. The rebels were on her at once, smelling roasted meat and threatening to kill her instantly if she did not produce it. She assured them that she had saved them a share and revealed the remains of her own child. Seized with horror and stupefaction, they stood paralyzed at the sight, but she said, this is my own child and my own handiwork. At that, they slunk away trembling, not daring to eat, although they were reluctant to yield even this food to the mother. The whole city soon rang with the abomination. When people heard of it, they shuddered as though they had done it themselves, end quote. Again, this is an actual observation 
from Flavius Josephus. And I think, again, very clearly uh, echoes and illustrates how utterly violent and desperate this siege became. A citation that I want to share from Shabbat.org, which is a Jewish historical journal. This is the Jewish perspective on the siege. Quote, A terrible hunger now ravaged the overcrowded city. Soon the last stores of food dwindled down. Rich people gave all their wealth for a bit of food. Even leather was cooked and eaten. At first the zealots had not been affected by hunger because they took other people's food. They too eventually became desperately hungry, eating their horses and even their horses' dung and saddles. In Josephus' account, the Jewish wars, the roofs were filled with women and small children expiring from hunger, and the corpses of old men were piled in the streets. Youths, swollen with hunger, wandered like shadows in the marketplace until they collapsed. No one mourned the dead because hunger had deadened all feeling. Those who fell to the ground turned their eyes for the last time to the holy temple and beheld the defenders still fighting and holding out. The best of friends would snatch food from each other. The Talmud recounts the sorry tale of a woman who killed and consumed her own baby, recalling the verse in Leviticus 26-29, You will eat the flesh of your sons and the flesh of your daughters you will eat. The streets were soon filled with corpses, and as it was hot summer weather, terrible epidemics broke out. Hundreds of people were found dead every morning. In their despair, many of the Jews tried to leave the enclosure of Jerusalem under the cover of night to seek something edible in the fields. They were easily captured, and Titus had them crucified in plain view of the city's defenders on the wall. In one night, Josephus tells us, five thousand Jews were discovered searching for food, and all were crucified. The battle raged for three weeks. The Jewish warriors were starving, exhausted, and far outnumbered by the Romans, but they continued to drive off the Romans. The last battle was on the morning of the ninth of Ave. The Jews fought valiantly, killing many Romans. Many of the structures adjoining the temple were burnt or on fire, but that morning the temple itself was still intact. According to Josephus, Titus did not want the temple to be burnt, apparently because a standing but vanquished temple would reflect more on Rome's glory. It was a single Roman soldier acting on his own initiative who hoisted on the shoulders of another soldier threw a firebrand into the temple. Titus tried to put a stop to the fire, but in the chaos his soldiers did not hear him. Other historians contradict this account of Titus's enlightened perspective and report that Titus ordered the temple destroyed. In either case, before long, the holy temple was engulfed in flames. The Jews frantically tried to stop the fire but were unsuccessful. In despair, many Jews threw themselves into the flames. The Roman soldiers rushed into the melee. Romans and Jews were crowded together and their dead bodies fell on top of each other The sound of screaming filled the air, and the floor of the temple was covered with bodies with blood streaming down the steps. The Romans brought idols into the temple and offered sacrifices to it. They took the golden vessels of the temple and killed every one they found. Before the fire consumed the temple completely, Titus entered the Holy of Holies and performed the most despicable acts. The still surviving Jews in the upper city could only watch as the temple burned down to its foundations. It burnt well into the next day. When the flames finally died down, left standing was the retaining wall on the western side of the Temple Mount. This is the western wall that still stands in Jerusalem today where Jews over the centuries have gathered to pray, end quote. Again, this gives us just a a jaw-dropping, astonishing view at the violence and the decadence that occurred within this attack, within this siege. And again, it's, it's imperative that we note Jesus prophesied this in Matthew chapter 24. We're going to look very quickly. We're running out of time. I want to read some citations from The Romans Destroy the Temple at Jerusalem in Eyewitness to History. I want us to look 
at a few things here that I think are interesting and that we need to consider. Quote, our only firsthand account of the Roman assault on the temple comes from the Jewish historian Flavius Josephus. Josephus was a former leader of the Jewish revolt who had surrendered to the Romans and had won favor from Vespasian. In gratitude, Josephus took on Vespasian's family name, Flavius, as his own. We join his account as the Romans fight their way into the inner sanctum of the temple. Again, these are the wordings from Josephus. The rebels shortly after attacked the Romans again, and a clash followed between the guards of the sanctuary and the troops who were putting out the fire inside the inner court. The latter routed the Jews and followed in hot pursuit right up to the temple itself. Then one of the soldiers, without awaiting any orders and with no dread of so momentous a deed, but urged on by some supernatural force, snatched a blazing piece of wood and climbing on another soldier's back, hurled the flaming brand through a low golden window that gave access on the north side to the rooms that surrounded the sanctuary. As the flames shot up, the Jews let out a shout of dismay that matched the tragedy. They flocked to the rescue with no thought of sparing their lives or husbanding their strength for the sacred structure that they had constantly guarded with such devotion was vanishing before their very eyes. No exhortation or threat could now restrain the impetuosity of the legions, for passion was in supreme command. Crowded together around the entrances, many were trampled down by their companions. Others, stumbling on a smoldering and smoke-filled ruins, died as miserably as the defeated. As they drew closer to the temple, they pretended not even to hear Caesar's orders, but urged the men in front to throw in even more firebrands. The rebels were powerless to help. Carnage and flight spread throughout. Most of the slain were peaceful citizens, weak and unarmed, and they were butchered where they were caught. The heap of corpses mounted higher and higher about the altar. A stream of blood flowed down the temple steps, and the body of those slain at the top slipped to the bottom. When Caesar failed to restrain the fury of his frenzied soldiers, and the fire could not be checked. He entered the building with his generals and looked at the holy place of the sanctuary and all of its furnishings, which exceeded by far the accounts current in foreign lands and fully justified their splendid repute in our own. As the flames had not yet penetrated to the inner sanctum, but were consuming the chambers that surrounded the sanctuary, Titus, Assumed correctly, there was still time to save the structure. He ran out and by personal appeals endeavored to persuade his men to put out the fire, instructing liberal alias, a centurion of the bodyguard of Lancers, to club any of the men who disobeyed his orders. But their respect for Caesar and the fear of the centurion staff who was trying to check them were overpowered by their rage, their detestation of the Jews, and an utterly uncontrolled lust for battle. While the temple was ablaze, the attackers plundered it, and countless people who were caught by them were slaughtered. There was no pity for age, and no regard was accorded rank. Children and old men, laymen and priests alike were butchered. Every class was pursued and crushed in the grip of war, whether they cried out for mercy or they offered resistance. Through the roar of the flames streaming far and wide, the groans of the falling victims were heard, such as was the height of the hill and the magnitude of the blazing pile, that the entire city seemed to be ablaze, and the noise, nothing more deafening and frightening could be imagined. The temple everywhere, enveloped in flames, seemed to be boiling over from its base, yet the blood seemed more abundant than the flames, and the numbers of the slain Greater than those of the slayers, the soldiers climbed over heaps of bodies as they chased the fugitives. End quote. Again, we need to consider the violence of this episode, and, and again, the reason for this attack in the first place. We know that the Roman Empire was dedicated to quashing. This result, they had attacked small town after small town, and this had escalated until finally the great city, the great Jerusalem, 
was being attacked and the temple would become the ultimate target. This occurred in 70 AD, and it's interesting to note from a historical perspective, this did not end the Jewish revolt once and for all because of uh, two years later, the siege of Masada, where the re remaining Jews had fled, the Romans would finally go to the mountain of Masada where the Jews had assembled, and this would become the Alamo, so to speak, for the Jewish nation. This would be their final stand, and at that point, surrounded, and again, these Jews had all witnessed the atrocities which had occurred in places from Qumran to Jerusalem. They knew what lie ahead. They knew that they would be slaughtered. They knew that they would be enslaved, and 900-plus Jews at Masada elected to commit mass suicide rather than fall into the hands of Jerusalem. For, again, from UK Apologetics, and I want us to look very quickly at the uh, punishment, the alleged punishment, which was inflicted upon the Jews by God at this point. A lot of scholars and writers and ministers and preachers today will argue that this was a just and divine punishment from God. Again, from UK Apologetics, quote, this early Christian understanding that the Jewish people were being punished for the rejection of Christ may seem very harsh today, but we must understand that this was a widespread view for many hundreds of years. Only now in an age of political correctness, liberal values, and a concern for human rights has it become unfashionable to express such a view. Yet, let there be no doubt that when the people of Judea demanded that Barabbas the robber should be released and that Jesus should be condemned, those people apparently accepted a curse upon themselves and upon their children for the rejection of Jesus. Scripture itself states, Matthew 27:25, Then all the people answered and said, Let his blood be on us and on our children. End quote. We're running out of time this evening. I want to share one final citation. This is from the theologian Philip Schaff, again, again talking about this punishment from God. This is taken from History of the Christian Church, pages 397 to 398, very quickly. Quote, The forbearance of God with his covenant people who had crucified their own Savior reached at last its limit. As many as could be saved in the usual way were rescued. The mass of the people had obstinately set themselves against all improvement. James the Just, the man who was fitted, if any could be, to reconcile the Jews to the Christian religion, had been stoned by his hardened brethren, for whom he daily interceded in the temple, and with him the Christian community in Jerusalem had lost its importance for that city. The hour of the great tribulation and fearful judgment drew near. The prophecy of the Lord approached its literal fulfillment Jerusalem was razed to the ground, the temple burned, and not one stone was left upon another, end quote. Verses to consider. I want to end here, and again, I want to remind our listeners that Doug Post will be addressing these in part two of this series on uh, May the 7th. And again, write these verses down because these will be studied in additional detail Matthew chapter 25, verses 31 and 32. Matthew 25, verses 41 and 46. I want to thank everyone for joining us this evening. We're having to cut a lot out of this presentation simply because of time restrictions. But again, I hope this lays the groundwork for what happened at Jerusalem. I hope this gives each of us a functional idea of the basis and the environment that existed at that time, and again, why the Roman army would decide to descend upon this city, and perhaps most importantly, the horrors that were witnessed and were recorded within that city. And again, the focus in week two of this will be a look at realized eschatology. We know beyond a historical doubt that these horrors occurred that the Roman army came in and slaughtered the wholesale eradication of over one million people. So again, in week two, the main emphasis and the point will be an address of realized eschatology. The question being, did 
Jesus' return in 70 A.D. That will be the focus of our week two study with Doug Post. It has been a pleasure to be with each of you this evening. I hope that this gives you some background uh, before you hear Doug Post's presentation. And as always, if anyone in our listening audience has any questions or comments that they would like to submit, we always welcome those. You can email those questions to Stevie. You can submit those to the Gospel Light radio program. want to thank all of our listeners tonight for being with us wherever you may be located. Again, my name is Tim Bench. Thank you so much for being with us, and God bless you all. These are the announcements for the events and activities in the Churches of Christ. If you would like to have your events or activities announced on this broadcast, please contact us at 910-425-1922 or send us an email to srbutler1009 at yahoo.com. On October the 1st through the 4th, 2018, the Southeastern Lectureship 2018 be hosted by the West Oak Grove Church of Christ. And that address is 3455 Highway 51 South, Fernando, Mississippi, 38632. For hotel information and registration, please contact the ministry evangelist, Terry D. Wallace, Sr. at 662-449-4191. On May the 19th through the 24th, 2018, the 2018 Churches of Christ National Lectureship, and the theme will be Exposition on the Race by Faith. The text used will be Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. The host, and, the host the evangelist will be Jefferson Carruthers of the Carver Road Church of Christ in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. Also, the area congregations in the triad in Greensboro, High Point, and Winston-Salem will be sponsoring this lectureship. Events will be held at the Connery Center, Convention Center on the Sheraton at Four Seasons, and that address is 3121 West Gate City Boulevard, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27407. And that telephone number is 336-292-9161. On May the 26th through the 28th, 2018, the Southside Church of Christ Homecoming. And the acapella concert on Saturday, May 26th at 4 p.m. featuring Total Praise, Revelation Acapella, and Genesis and Live. On Sunday, May 27th, there'll be a worship service at 10.30 a.m. and a program at 3.30 p.m. On April the 8th through the 12th, 2018, the 74th Annual Carolina Lectures, and their theme will be Back to the Bible in a Progressive World. The host congregation is the Highland Acres Church of Christ, and that address is 1301 McLarlin Street, Statesville, North Carolina. There will be congregational singing each weeknight at 6.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. For more information, please give them a call at 704-872-7535. The ministry evangelist is Al Simmons. On April the 8th through the 12th, 2018, there's a gospel meeting held at the Westover Avenue Church of Christ in Greensboro, North Carolina. And that address is 811 West Wendover Avenue. For more information, please give them a call at 336-457-1095. And the guest speaker will be Godfrey Sykes from Clarksville, Tennessee. And just to remind you, Stevie B's Media Production presents We Are Airing Live Shows here on Blog Talk Radio. You can also hear my on-demand episodes on iHeartRadio, on ACARadio.net, on YouTube, on iWay Radio, MCCBroadcasting.com, and World of Acapella. And Spreakers.com On Tuesday night from 6 to 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 5 to 7 p.m. Central Standard Time, I'll be hosting a live show, What a Word from the Lord. On this broadcast, we will have guest speakers each week presenting lessons from the Word of God. We also have a new segment, The Community Corner. And this segment is for small business owners and entrepreneurs 
who have products and services to offer to our community. Also, my guest speaker, Edward Bishop, will be bringing us a lesson from the Word of God as well. And then on Tuesday night, I'm hosting the live show, the Gospel Light Radio Show, which airs on Blog Talk Radio from Thursday from 6 to 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time and 5 to 7 p.m. Central Standard Time. I have eight co-hosts on that broadcast who are presenting lessons from the Word of God. And also, I'm taking questions from my social media platform, the Shout It Out group on Facebook, and posing those to my co-hosts on that broadcast. And then on Friday night from 6 to 8 p.m., Eastern Standard Time, 5 to 7 p.m. Central Standard Time. I'm hosting the live show, Stevie B's Acapella Gospel Music Blast. And on that broadcast, I'm interviewing artists, debuting new music, featuring old music in the Story Glory segment. And the second week, my daughter, Tati B, she's my co-host. So she's doing the playlist on that broadcast. And then the third week, I'm doing the Top 20 Countdown show. And the fourth week, we have the Talent Search Show. you got 60 seconds to stand on the world stage and sing your song. First and second place prizes will be awarded. And then once a quarter, we have the Marathon Show. And this will conclude our announcements. Your word.
because at the first point of contact, you're not going to always get uh, the sale or get them to come to church or what have you, but you have to do something that's going to get a reaction out of them and to at least pique their interest. And so having a target audience, you got to know what it is that your target audience is looking for. Um, I'll just, just use this as an example. Certain places where uh, the Church of Christ is and, 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 and demographics and all of that, you know, certain groups that you may not be able to reach just because you're not in that demographic. You know, I know there are some churches that are in kind of gang-infested areas, and so, um, you know, their ministry, their work, uh, their service is going to be a little bit different than it is in a, in a suburban or well-to-do area. Not to say that uh, we're not leading all people to the same Christ and, and to, the, to the one body, but it's certain things that you have to do for different target audiences and, and to be able to reach them. And so that, that goes into a lot of detail. I don't really have time to go into that. But, you know, identifying a target audience and reaching those people where they are. The second thing is a value proposition. What makes us different? What makes you different? What makes your congregation different? Now, when, when, when people drive up the road, you see all kinds of churches. You know, you see 10, 15 churches, you know, within a couple of blocks, you know, different churches, different names, uh, different looking uh, uh, buildings and facilities and things of that nature. What's going to make your church different? What's your value proposition? What is it that you're going to offer to this audience that you're now reaching out to and that you're targeting? And I know we're offering you know, Christ, we're, we're preaching the word and salvation and this and that, but who isn't saying that? I mean, everybody is saying that. What's, what's going to make your church marketing different? What's going to get the people uh, to, to, to even sit down and, and open up to you? Um, and so you got to have a value proposition. you got to have something that's very uh, uh, different, very unique when it comes to your style of ministry. And that's, once again, it's not, that's not changing the message. It's just changing your method, you know. Um, and that's something that, that I know that, that we need to continue to remember. The third thing is developing a, a marketing budget. You know, we have a budget for a lot of different programs, the senior programs and the young adults, the millennials, the marriage couples, the this, the that, the building fund, and this, and, and, and so on and so forth, you know, getting a church van. But a lot of times we fail to uh, develop a, a strong marketing budget, and that's, that's very important. Coming from a guy like me that, uh, that, that's a marketer, you know, that's real important because in a lot of cases you get what you pay for because, you know, some churches – feel like that marketing is not as important. We got the people, we got the congregation. They can go out, they're our marketers. They're the ones that's going to go out and reach the people. And it doesn't always turn out that way. Sometimes you do have to pay a professional or bring in somebody that kind of knows what they're doing because what you'll find out is that you'll end up saving in the long run and then you'll start getting better results. So develop a marketing budget. It's really, I mean, whether small, it could be, you know, $200, $300 a month or whatever, five, six hundred dollars a month, whatever you decide to do, but just develop a marketing budget, uh, even if it's a budget to get flyers so that your members can't go and pass out, you know. Um, the next thing is a website. That's very crucial. A lot of times when you talk to someone about what church you go to or what you're doing, you give them a card or, or you invite them to church, one of the first things they're going to do in this day and age, they're going to go and look for it on the web, and they're going to go and look up the church on the website that they, they want to see before they bring their family and so on and so forth. So um, that's going to be very important is to have a professional-looking website. It doesn't have to have all the bells and whistles, but just make sure that it looks neat, that it looks clean, that it looks, you know, uh, in an orderly, uh, easy-to-follow fashion. Um, have some images on there. Get, get you a good photographer or a camera where you can take good pictures and make sure that the pictures are quality pictures. Uh, CVB can kind of attest to this. I've, I've worked with him uh, and do some work with him on his flyers and the artwork and things of that nature. And one of the first things that I did when I started working with CV was I told him, I'm like, dude, you got to go and get some professional pictures done. You got to spend some money, get some professional pictures done, because that's going to make a world of difference when it comes to somebody doing graphic design and designing the artwork. So uh, same thing for a website. You need to have some good quality pictures and, and do your best. You know, if they're pictures of people in your congregation, the pictures of you guys doing uh, service in the community or just doing some, you know, some, some photos just around uh, the congregation where you guys meet up, just, just, you know, get some real images. Don't pull up images 
from, uh, you know, stock footage that, that may not correlate with the target audience that you're trying to reach and people get to your congregation, they realize, okay, man, that's different than what's on the website. It's like you already lied to them. Video, uh, doing video production on your website is, is crucially important. Have a video on that. Do a welcome video. As soon as somebody go to your website, you know, welcome them to the website and talk a little bit about uh, the church. Something about two minutes or so uh, is real good. A landing page. Like when you're on social media, you're putting your website, people click that link, they're going to go to a landing page. They're going to go to a page on your website, and on that landing page, you need to have some, some detailed instructions as to what you want them to do. That's called a call to action. When I go to that landing page, what you, I've landed on your page, now what do you want me to do? And you need to have a call to action. One of the most common call to actions is please, you know, subscribe, join our email list, or, you know, be our guest. Um, and, and email list, and that's another thing I want to mention too, email list is very important because what it does, it helps you create a database. Because I may not, uh, I may go to your website, but I may not visit your church for three or four months. But now you have my email address and you can start, you know, sending some things to me, you know, community events or, you know, uh, special guest Sunday or something like that. Um, you know, it makes it easier to market to people that have voluntarily given you their email address. And so that's crucial too with the website. Uh, the fifth thing is social media marketing. Same thing, images, videos, posts. You know, make sure that somebody is posting. If you have somebody that's dedicated to doing your social media, you know, make sure that they're posting often, uh, you know, whether it's a scripture or, you know, congratulating maybe the graduates, you know, the high school, middle school, elementary graduates, you know, something that's on uh, the social media page for that church. The other thing is member check-in. When people come to the, the, the building Sunday morning, Wednesday night, you know, most of your folks that come there, they got their phone. I know they told you that they're reading the Bible on the phone, but they're not they're on Facebook, you know. Uh, but, but, you know, hey, tell them, since you're on Facebook anyway, go ahead and check in while you're here. Because what that does, that, that alerts their friend that they've now checked in at that particular location and you never know. Their friends may say, "What you know, so and so doing today?" They click on there and they see where they're at, and and, and it just you know it just helps out when it comes to expanding the brand. Uh, and the last thing is just be open to change. I I know that this is this whole internet thing is something that uh, you know that that's new or whatever, or you know, towards marketing on the internet is something new. But let's be open to change. Like I said, we're not changing the message, but we're changing the the method on how we do things, and we have to get. Uh, you know, a little bit more aggressive with how we're marketing and how we're putting, uh, you know, the kingdom of God on, on front street, especially when it comes to uh, social media and, and the Internet, because it's real important. Um, you know, stick with things that work, you know, trial and error. That's how you're going to learn. Hey, this, this particular flyer didn't work, or that particular flyer got so many likes. So people like this video. People like this style. People like to see this you know, our target audience, and so let's keep doing it. Or, hey, this doesn't look good, or it doesn't get a good reaction, you know, take it out. And that's the great thing about Internet marketing is that you don't have to get stuck into, you know, a long-term thing. You can make changes as you go. Um, so that's, that's real key. Um, when it comes to church marketing, that's just a real brief overview. Um, I know this year I'm going to be working on doing workshops for different congregations that would have me come out and do a full, you know, two-day workshop on how we can really get into some church marketing and some of the things that we can do. And what I want to do, I want to come to places uh, and equip the folks that you have there to, to basically do what it is that I know how to do uh, because there are a lot of people, a lot of gifted people in, in, in most of the churches that can do what it is that I do. They just kind of don't have the techniques and, and the, you know, the little skills and the know-how. And so that would be my job is to come to your congregation, uh, do a two-day workshop, you know, equip you guys so that, you know, you can kind of be off and running and, you know, being more productive and getting reactions and getting results. Um, so that's that's it uh, for now. Like I said, my phone number is 804-885-0558. You can always reach out to CVB as far as how to reach me, um, you know, my website and all that stuff. Uh, he'll be able to get that information to you. CVB, thank you once again for allowing me to share uh, one of the things that I do with your listeners. All right, my brother. I certainly appreciate you, man. Yes, sir. Thank you so much, man. All right. Coming up next, we'll have my co-host, Edward Bishop, and he'll be bringing us a lesson from the Word of God. Stay tuned to What a Word from the Lord with your host, Stevie R. Butler. I'll be with the Lord. I'll be with the Lord. While the ages roll on. While the ages roll on. 
Through the valley of death Through the valley of death I'm sure I must go I'm sure I must go So the wages of I'll be judged by the deed. I'll be judged by the deed. And the seed I have sown. And the seed I have sown. And I'll live with my Savior. And I'll live with my Savior. While the ages roll on. 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 Jonah rose to flee unto Tarsus from the presence 
of the Lord and went down to Joppa. And he found a ship going to Tarsus. So he paid the fare thereof and went down into it to go with them to Tarsus for the presence of the Lord. But the Lord sent out a great wind to the sea. And there was a mighty tempest in the sea. So that the ship was like to be broken. Then the mariners said, uh, were afraid and cried every man unto his God. And cast forth the wares that were in the ship into the sea to lighten it of them. But Jonah was gone down into the side of the ship, and he lay and was past the sea. So the shipmaster came to him and said unto him, What meanest thou, O sleeper? Or why call upon God, thy God? If so, that God will think upon us that we perish not. And they said, everyone to his fellow, come and let us cast lots that we may know for whose cause this evil is upon us. So they cast their lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Then said they unto him, tell us, we pray thee, for whose cause this evil is upon us. What is thy occupation? And which cometh thou? What is thy country? And of what people are thou? And he said unto them, I am a Hebrew. Fear the Lord, the God of heaven, which hath made the sea and the dry land. Then were the men exceedingly afraid, and said unto him, Why hast thou done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord, because he had told them. Said they unto him, What shall we do unto thee, that the sea may be calm unto us? For the sea wall in was tempered. And he said unto them, Take me up and cast me forth into the sea. So shall the sea be calm unto you. For I know that for my sake this tempest is upon you. Nevertheless, the men rolled hard to bring it to the land, but they could not, for the sea walk and was temperate against them. Wherefore they cried unto the Lord and said, We beseech thee, O Lord, we beseech thee, let us not perish man's life, and lay not upon us innocent blood, for thou, O Lord, hast done as so he took up stone and carried him forth into the sea, and the sea ceased from her raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice unto the Lord and made vow. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish, swallowed up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish. Three days and three nights. I want to speak as the Spirit shall guide. Just for a brief moment on the subject. In what direction are you going? In what direction are you going? Have you ever taken a trip somewhere uh, that you had never been 
and did not follow the direction that were given? Or thought that you knew a much better way to get to your destination, only to find out that the way, because you did not follow the plan according to the map, that you not only ended up somewhere, you did not only end up where you didn't want to be, but you ended up somewhere you didn't want to be. Oh, that is the story uh, in the case of Jonah. As you notice in the second verse, first verse, the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amity, saying, God, in other words, God said, Jonah, said, I want you to do. I had a job for you. I have a mission for you. I have plans for you. And God told him, he said, my plans for you is I want you to arise. I want you to get up from where you are. I want you to get up from what you are doing. Uh, You seem to be too comfortable where you're at. Oh, some of us, sometimes we get comfortable, too comfortable as where we are, and we don't want to get up, and we don't want to do the work that we have been called to do. Uh, We don't want to accomplish that which God has set for us to do. I said, rise and go to Nineveh. Why do I want you to go to Nineveh? I want you to cry out against that great city. Oh, that's just like some of us. As children of the Most High God, God has called us out of the world by his marvelous light. But not only did he call us out of his marvelous light and into the church, he called us out of the world to become children and ambassadors for his great kingdom. Just like he had a job for Jonah to go and preach the gospel to those who were in sin, to those who were astray. To those who did not know the love of the messianic master, oh, just like some of us, he didn't want to go. We don't want to go and teach the gospel to our co-workers, oh, because they get on our nerves and we just don't like them. Oh, we don't want to preach the gospel to our enemy. Because we would rather see them get what we think they deserve. We become their judge, their jury, and their executioner. Uh, we are sometimes, we don't want to go out and preach the gospel to our friends because we think that if we tell them that they're in sin and that God has called you out of sin, and if you, if your friends stay in the condition that they're in, they're going to lose their soul. And we are afraid if we tell our friends that, that they will no longer want to be our friends. But God said, Jonah, I want you to go to that city. And I want you to tell the folks there that their sin has come up for me. They are in such a bad state that if they don't get to act together, that I am going to completely and utterly destroy them. Oh, you know what that reminds me of? The story of Noah. Oh, you're familiar with the story of Noah and 
how for in that time is the thoughts and intents of man's heart and deeds are evil continually, that they did nothing right in the sight of God, that all they did and all they thought of, always evil. And God got to a point where he got so tired of it that he said, I am going to utterly and completely destroy mankind. He said, I am sorry that I created man. Oh. Now, Nineveh, that great city, had gotten to that point that I am going to have to completely and destroy, utterly destroy that city because there is nothing good in that city. That city is nothing but sin. So now, knowing that I cannot look upon sin, I am going to now have to completely and utterly destroy them if they don't repent. Oh, and Jonah thought he knew better than God. Jonah said, I have to do something. I don't want to go to that city. I don't want to tell those folk that if they don't get their act together, that God is going to completely and utterly destroy them. So I'll know what I'll do. He says, I will rise. And I will go to another place. Did not tell me to go. I am going to go to a place where I can escape the presence of God. Oh, but I'm here to let you know on this evening that you cannot escape the presence of God. Wherever you go, God is already there. And when you get to where you're going, things you just get away from the presence of God, God's going to say, where have you been? I've been waiting on you. Oh, you know the story in the book of Psalms where where David asks, he says, where can I go from the presence of God? If I lay my bed in hell, he says, you're there. If I fly to the uttermost part of the depth of the sea, you're there. There is nowhere on earth that you can go and escape the presence of God. Oh, if God has something for you to do, uh, you're going to do it one way or another. And just to show Jonah, to remind Jonah on who he was dealing with, to remind Jonah on who God is, God says, I am going to fix Jonah. Oh, but the Lord sent out a great wind into the sea. And there was a mighty tempest in the sea. So that the ship was like to be broken. Sometimes we have storms in our lives because we are not going in the direction. God wants us to go. And in order sometimes in our lives, in order for God to get our attention, he is going to have to allow uh, storms and certain circumstances and situations to happen to us so that we will put our focus on God where it belongs and take the focus off ourselves. Take the focus on what we want and 
what we think we should have and what we think we should do is work on. We have thorns in our lives because we're going in the opposite direction of the direction that God wants us to go. And sometimes in order to get us right on the right back on the right track, God is going to have to allow storms and not life to get to such a point to where we have no other choice but to say, God, I'll do it your way. God, I need you now. God, I've got myself into a situation because I was not going in the direction you wanted me to go in. And now I realize that now, Lord, help me to get back to where you want me to be. And then the mariners were afraid and cried every man unto his God. Oh, sometimes when we're not going in the direction that God wants us to go in, it doesn't only affect us. It affects those around us. It may affect those that we love. Oh, I wish I had more time to deal with this direction. Uh, I think I'll continue it next week because we have to get to such a point in our lives that our direction is in the same direction as God said earlier. Sometimes, in order for that to happen, we have to have those storms. And sometimes, we try to escape the presence and the power of God because he has something for us to do and we just don't want to do it because we think we know better than God. And God has to remind us of who he is and who we are in relationship to who God is. Oh, my time is up. So next week I will continue this lesson. I will pick up that verse uh, number six. Is that all right? So at this time, I will turn things back over to my good brother, Stevie Butler. Thank you for your time and your attention. I know. Walking.
that's why I'm glad. I'm glad. I said I'm glad. I'm glad I know you, Lord. I'm so glad you know I'm me, Lord. I'm glad you know me, Lord. We want to give you the praise. Marriage 
was designed by God to fulfill a basic need of man, and that is companionship. The first five days of creation repeatedly have God observing his work and noting that it was good. Genesis chapter 1, verse 9, also verse 12, verse 18, verse 21 and 25. We find the scriptures declaring that God says of his work that it was good. The almighty God made man on the sixth day and noted in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 18, it is not good that man should be alone. God said, I will make him a helper comparable to him. The creator brought every animal he made to Adam to be named. Genesis chapter 2, verses 19 and 20. The relation of man to the animals of the field would not feel this loneliness of man. Adam knew this from his naming of the animals, according to William E. Wilson's writings and notes. God revealing to man of the special creation who was to serve as his companion for life brought forth a wonderful statement from the man. We find in Genesis chapter 2, verses 23 and 24, Adam says, this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Moses inspired addition seems fully appropriate. Moses would go on to say, therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh well let's look at the second point from this lesson and that is God's law for marriage Jesus Christ our Lord most thorough teaching about marriage arose because of the Pharisees' question. In Matthew chapter 19 and verse 3, the Pharisees asked the Lord, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for just any reason? The Lord thought the answer was implicit in Moses' account of the creation of man and woman. We find in Matthew chapter 19, verses 1 through 6, Jesus asked the Pharisees, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female, and said, For this reason, A man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two, but one flesh. Ladies and gentlemen, God saw marriage as a permanent relationship, only to be severed by death. The Apostle Paul would say in Romans chapter 7 and verse 2, For the woman who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. But if the husband dies, she is released from the law 
of her husband. That's Romans chapter 7 and verse 2. God's basic law for marriage is easy to see when one removes the exception from Jesus' words to the Pharisees. In Matthew chapter 19 and verse 9, listen to Jesus. Jesus says, and I say to you, whosoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery, and whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. In Matthew chapter 19, verse 9, with except for sexual immorality, Replaced by an ellipsis, God intended for marriage to last for life because it fulfills an important need of man, and that is companionship. God's law applies to whoever, not being limited to Christians. There is not an in any indication of what is termed covenant legislation which only applies to Christians, all others being free to divorce and remarry as much as they wish prior to conversion and remain with the last marriage partner before one becomes a child of God, according to Woodson on page four. And which brings us to the third point of this lesson, and that is divorce is a sensitive issue. Divorce is nowhere to be found in God's original plan. It is a difficult subject to discuss because it involves the pinnacle of human relationships. The failure of that relationship is painful to the most innermost core of a man's heart. William Woodson observes, quote, It deals with matters which very few exceptions are and can be known for sure only by a very small number of people, end quote. Divorce is is very personal. Nothing could be more delicate than the intimacy of marriage. Nothing could be more difficult to discuss than those aspects of those intimacies which have been perverted and destroyed. It can become quite volatile as the extended family of both partners sense the pain their beloved is experiencing, which brings us to our fourth point of this lesson. And that is, divorce was not in the original plan. The Pharisees apparently understood Jesus to be saying that God intended for one man to be married to one woman for life. They were driven to ask, why then did Moses command to give a certificate of divorce and to put her away. Jesus Christ, our Lord, responded, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, permitted you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. Matthew chapter 19, verses 7 and 8. There is a significant difference between their question and the Lord's answer. They asked why Moses commanded, but Jesus said Moses permitted. There were two primary schools of thought among the Jews. Shamarai interpreted Deuteronomy 24 and verse 1 as follows, quote, The man is not to release his wife unless he has found something indecent in her, end quote. 
In contrast, Hilliard allows, this quote, allows as a charge the fact that in cooking the wife has burnt her husband food, end quote. This is from Lazinski, page 727. Ladies and gentlemen, it is easier to follow the more lax view of Hilliard, which is precisely what is represented in the Pharisees' question. Jesus Christ, our Lord, returns to the creation, making it clear that divorce was never part of God's original plan. Which brings us to the fifth point of this lesson. And that is fornication, the exception. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus set forth the only exception to God's law for marriage when he included except for sexual immorality. The word uh, pornia. Let me let me spell that. P o r n e i a. Pornia is used of illicit sexual intercourse in general. This is from Thales, page five thirty two. Some uh, elaborate on all the possible sexual sins to violate God's law regarding relations that are to be reserved only for one's mate. It is sufficient to say that God only intended such intimacies for the two companions within a marriage. Jesus Christ, our Lord, Jesus was speaking to the Jews who knew nothing of a woman's divorcing her husband. He naturally specified only the case of a husband divorcing his wife. The fact that among us were also wives divorcing their husbands, his words apply to them equally, needs hardly be addressed. See Mark chapter 10 and verse 12. Because Mark now is writing for Gentiles. And this is in Lewinsky's page 230. Which brings us to the last point of this lesson. And that is the Apostle Paul's instructions. Part of the Apostle Paul's first epistle to the Church of God in Corinth was written in response to questions the brethren had asked. One question seems to be, should a Christian who is joined to Christ separate from the union of marriage? 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10 and 11. The Lord had answered this question likely in the very verses we have already examined. The general rule was that they should not even separate. Paul says, if she and her husband cannot live harmoniously together, let her remain unmarried. She is not permitted to marry again. That would be adulterous. This is in Lipcombs, page 98. The Christian woman who has separated from her husband but found that she cannot live the single life and remain pure has only one path open to her. She is to be reconciled to the husband whom she has injured. The Apostle Paul went on to speak regarding the rest, which seems to involve the marriage of a believer and an unbeliever. It's in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 12 and 13. The Apostle Paul, as an inspired apostle, 
gave his divine instruction in reference to a situation that was not addressed by the Lord in his personal ministry. If the brother married to an unbelieving wife is pleased to dwell with her, he is free to do so. He is not to put her away. This is according to Woodson on page 3. Verse 15 contains the Apostle Paul's instructions for a believing companion when the spouse chooses to depart. The only term on which he will continue the marriage is for the Christian to leave the Lord and become a pagan. The Christian has not been and is not bound to leave the Lord. In such cases, to pervert, to preserve a marriage, the price of which is for her to leave the Lord, the Christian is not bound. Christian is called in peace. To be in peace with God, whatever the difficulty imposed by impossible demands by another, husband or not, We might say the Christian is not enslaved to the unbeliever to whom he or she is married. So in conclusion tonight, God gave man a companion for life when he made Eve and established the first marriage. He intended marriage to be for life. Divorce is a very sensitive matter involving many emotions. It was in no way a part of God's original plan. The Lord gave one reason for divorce. Sexual relations that violate God's law. The Apostle Paul instructions regarding Christian married to Christians are intended to have them stay together. Separation would not allow one or both to marry another. Christians married to unbelievers can remain with them, yet they are not enslaved to them. The Christian should allow the unbeliever to depart in lieu of surrendering their relationship to the Lord and doing such in the most peaceful way possible may ultimately lead to the salvation of their spouse. 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 16. And I'll see you on the other side of the break.
time, but that's all right because this on the on-demand episode you'll be able to hear all of this. So I want to go ahead and use this portion of the broadcast to extend the Lord's invitation. If you are not a child of God, and one cannot be a child of God until you are a Christian, until you have been born again, as the Bible teaches, then you are lost outside of Christ. It's not enough to be religious. You must obey the commands of the Lord. In order for a man to be saved, you must take heed and answer the gospel call. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 14. You must hear the gospel. John chapter 6, verse 45, Romans chapter 10, verse 14 and 17. And the facts of the gospel are the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1 through 3. You must believe the same. James chapter 2 and verse 24. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 6. The Bible says, without faith it's impossible to please God. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is he is a reward of them that diligently seek him. You must repent. Jesus said in Luke chapter 13, verses 3 and 5, I tell you nay, but except you repent, you will all likewise perish. And then Paul would say again in Acts 17 and verse 30, that God commanded all men everywhere to repent. You must confess your faith in Christ Jesus. Romans chapter 9, verses 9 and 10. Matthew chapter 10, verses 32 and 33, Jesus said, If you don't confess me before men, I will not confess you before my Father. You must be baptized in water for the remission of the forgiveness of your sins. Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, Acts 10 and verse 48, 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 21. And if you are a Christian and you have not been faithful in your service to God, then you can decide again by repentance and prayer. Acts chapter 8 and verse 22. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to encourage you to visit the Church of Christ in your local area. Amen. And I'll see you on the other side of the break. Sometimes, sometimes.
Yeah. <laughs> 